Welcome to the Legacy Leaders Podcast. Are you doing the best for your client to help them create their legacy? Are you creating a plan that goes far beyond finances to help people ensure that it becomes the driving force behind all decisions? On this podcast, hosts Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller will help you with growing your practice and your client's peace of mind. Together, they bring the best and brightest minds to share with you how to help your clients develop their best legacy. And now, here are your hosts, Katie Beth and Stan. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Legacy Leaders Podcast. My name is Carol Dewey. I am a legacy leader and one of the hosts here on our podcast show. I have a special guest with me here today. His name is Ron Smuda. I've worked with Ron now for a little while in helping my clients to achieve their estate and legacy planning goals and needs. Ron is an estate planning attorney. He's a CPA and the founder of the Zmuda Law Firm. Uh, Ron, welcome to our show. Thanks for participating today. Thank you, Carol, for having me. Perhaps, Ron, we can start by letting you share a little bit about your background, uh, maybe why you decided to go to law school and, and choose estate planning to get into. Yeah, um, so making this story short, as short as possible. I mean, I grew up in an accounting background, accounting family, and then there's that adage that if you ask an accountant what one plus one is, they'll tell you two. If you ask the CPA, they said it could be three. But then if you go out and ask an attorney, the answer is always going to be the, well, what do you want it to be? So growing up in that, um, in that lifestyle, just in that family accounting firm where we regularly inter interacted with attorneys um, and having already earned my undergrad and my MBA, I just looked for what was next and what was um, the best and just dealing with attorneys regularly in our practice who have that profound knowledge of the law, just envied them and what they're able to do. And just there's certain limitations put on we'll say CPAs and accountants that aren't existent on attorneys um, that I just strove to, to get to that top, get, get to the top. Um, and then why estate planning? And I guess at first it was just simply a parallel, parallel to tax. I was always in the tax world. It was just a parallel field. Um, but once starting actually to practice it and get further into it, I, I realized that estate planning is a lot more than just simply trying to save your clients and their families money. Well, yes, that's a big advantage of estate planning. Um, estate planning, I really find to be relationship planning. So not only with yourself and getting to know your clients, getting to know your um, client's family, and it's not so much a cold transaction, but it's also relationship planning as it relates to the clients and their own families because so often when, when a death in a family um, happens it ends up driving the wedge in the family so my job is to try to prevent that and hopefully save money and time along the way well that sounds great now, would you say that you're also, you, you mentioned your, you grew up in a, in a family where it was more on the accounting side, building an accounting firm. Um, so would you say you're kind of continuing your family legacy with adding to what, what they've already established? Yeah. Yeah. I would say that would be a, a great way to, great way to put it. Okay. Okay, Ron. So um, you know, what kind of meaning does that have for you? Something that I often use with clients is that what I say with the state planning is that what you're doing is giving the gift of convenience to your spouse and your kids and your family. Um, what that means is that you right now are putting the legwork, spending the time and money so that there aren't fights, there aren't um Things that could potentially go wrong, whether that's something that's in your control now, in the, their control later, what you're doing is setting in stone what you want. And I say set in stone because a lot of estate planning, the majority of estate planning can be changed throughout your life. So um, it's not entirely set in stone when I say that, but 
what you're doing is providing your your family and anyone who comes after you a gift of convenience and any way that we can help provide that is, is what I strive to to help do. Great. And, you know, since I've worked with you for a little while, um, I know that you didn't just jump out of law school and establish your own uh, law firm. So maybe you can give us a little idea of how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Um, so as we alluded earlier before, I worked in the, we'll say the family accounting firm for a while um, before going to law school. And then after that, I worked at a AMLA 100 firm for a handful of years, um, working with the very best, best and brightest uh, attorneys out there. And primarily the client base for that firm were the ultra high net worth clients. So that we'll say 20 million plus up to hundreds of million. From there, I've transitioned to more a regional side, mid-sized firm that focused more on your average person as well as those with special needs and Medicare planning. So brought in the base from, from that standpoint. And that's where you really learned at least what I call the true purpose of estate planning and how to build relationships as your with your client, with the everyday person and more common problems. And then now for the past two or so years, been on my own, bringing together the more advanced techniques learned from the first big firm and then the touch and the care that was learned from the medium firm. Well, that's great. So you've got that experience from some of the ultra wealthy. Did you get to work with any celebrities? I did, but I'll leave but that you off can't of disclose here. who they are, right? Yeah, I'll leave that off of here. <laughs> and uh, and then, so when it comes to um, your ideal client, um, you've got the experience of working with that ultra wealthy all the way down to maybe more of your probably what middle class average American family. Mm -hmm. Um, so today, what would you say is your, your ideal client? Of course, the ideal client is the one with tens of million dollars that we need advanced planning and save their kid to save their kids millions. And then I can charge tens of thousands of dollars a fee for, but of course those are the ideal clients, but no, um, all, all kidding aside, I really want to say that there is an ideal client absent of one who's, you know, willing to work, who knows for the reason why they're, why they're doing this. Because one of the biggest you know, misconceptions of estate planning is that it's only for the wealthy. That um, I, I don't have millions. I don't even have hundreds of thousands. Why am I doing this? Why bother? So it's, the ideal client would be someone who understands why and why it's important for everyone. And it, it's my job to kind of help convey why it's um, so important. With the Tax Cut, Cut and Jobs Act that was passed a few, years, a few years ago, which doubled the state tax exemption. And then with inflation since then, it just has skyrocketed the exemption amount. Um, before, it was only the wealthy who had to worry about estate taxes, but now it's only the extremely wealthy that have to worry about estate taxes. So that's not a concern for most people. Um, what seems to be, or I shouldn't say seems to be, what is the, we'll say, primary motive for the vast majority of people is probate avoidance, which is the biggest driving factor for most estate planning. And for most people or for people who don't know, um, every state has its own probate laws. And generally speaking, there are great laws that instruct you how your assets should be divided when you're gone. Um, four, we'll say four out of five times, it's exactly what you want. It goes to your spouse, to your kids. But laws change and um, who knows what they'll be when that day comes down the road. So estate planning for probate avoidance is saying to the government, basically, thank you, but no thank you. That I'm gonna 
I'm going to direct how my property wants, how I want my property distributed. And not only that, um, probate and dealing with the probate court is extremely expensive, extremely time consuming. So any way that we can try to prevent that, prevent spending that, um, I would much rather have a client come in who is spend who spends one, two, maybe three thousand dollars with me now, get it, everything set up right, then have some their kids come down to me years down the road and say, Dad died without me knowing what to do, and then end up charging them fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to try to untangle a mess. So my roundabout way of saying my ideal client is someone who comes in um, looking to try to give that gift of convenience to their kids and willing to work. Now, when you're working with these clients, do you find it's more than sometimes at least more than just trying to get their affairs in order? Um, I mean, for me, I kind of see a little bit of a trend in um, people really wanting to pass down maybe some of their values and virtues and and things like that, yeah. like a step beyond estate planning, more, more of a legacy planning. What do you want to leave behind? Yeah, um, that is, I'll say, f- very common in, we'll say, business owners. It's common across the board, but it's very common business owners and people who have created a, a business have employees that they have a culture that they have learned and it derived from their own personal life that they want to keep the business going, but not only um, the business, but like I said, it's drive them from their personal life that they want to make sure that their kids and family kind of are still involved in the same, involved in the same things, involved in the same morals way to take care. So we, we try to build in, while you can't necessarily force a lot of things onto them. You try to build in wants and needs and then have supplemental kind of documents. And then it goes kind of back to the relationship planning that I said towards the beginning, especially if you have older children that we want to have family meetings that kind of talk about what it, what we're doing and why we're doing it. So definitely we, we try to, um, keep everyone involved and pass along the the legacy, so to speak, is that you've built. Right. Well, are there any like common misconceptions or things that you find that what I used to, what I always called those things where people think they know that just aren't so? Yeah. The, the biggest one is definitely that the estate planning is only for the wealthy. Um, that is something that if you have any assets at all, if you have a house, if you have, you know, anything outside of, we'll say, bare minimum estate planning is for you. Um, you don't necessarily need the biggest, most elaborate series of trusts and cascading things that flow into each other like the extremely wealthy do, but it's just estate planning in general is for you. Um, and then the, the biggest, another, one of the biggest misconceptions is, um, it, when we come into like special needs planning, um, that social workers are do an amazing job, but they're so overwhelmed that they often provide answers that is what is easiest and not so much what what is right. And um, the biggest example of this is um, oftentimes when you have a special needs child approaching, approaching age 18, uh, social workers will often say, well, we need to give put them in a guardianship right now. Um, but guardianships are in, extremely intrusive. It strips the kids um, rights entirely. Uh, and we try to strive to, you know, see that goal of goal of independence with a special need child, it may or may not 
ever never come. But to strip the rights right off from right off the bat isn't what we try to do. So there's other techniques out there that um, we want to do. So a, a misconception is more that estate planning isn't necessarily for for them. It, it's more for people who are planning for your own your own life, end of life planning, when it's really your entire entire holistic family planning. Okay. Well, is there anything, is there any, do you recall any particular stories that you can share about something um, because of lack of planning that went horribly wrong? Um, I'll keep it general and say that just dealing with probate. Um, probate, in the probate court, I do a, a lot of um, probate administrations and people do not realize how costly and time, um, how much time it takes. On average, and it takes about six to seven months. It, if you do every single thing right, it might be four months. But on average, it's six to seven months, and that's six to seven months without you having access to the, the money that was left behind. It just sits there in the court going on and on as you wait for it and file document after document. So the story of what goes wrong is anytime anyone has to deal with the probate courts, because it is something that can be completely avoided. We can have your um, your state set up that the next day, the next day after you're gone, that your kids are able to get your spouse, your kids are able to get to your assets and start to pay for your last expenses and you know receive their inheritance without having to wait so long and dip into their own pocket to pay those expenses. Yeah. Um... I've worked with families both who've had their affairs in order and and those that have had to go through probate. And, you know, it's not something that's fun, especially after you've you're, you know, mourning the loss of somebody in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's it can be not the best situation um, for everyone. Is there. Um, any particular challenge that you can think of as when you're working with clients, um, particularly? Yeah, the biggest challenge that I come across is just making sure that they know that it's not just not just me, not just coming in, getting documents signed, and then it's done. Um, we work with you closely, and at the very end, right after the signing meeting. The next thing we do is provide you with a, a list of how to name your beneficiary des designations, which if you have a lot of accounts, um, this is a bit of legwork, legwork on your end, which more than happy to help and hold your hand work through, but it's still stuff that you as the client have to do. You have to go and talk to the banks. Um, and if you don't do it, then you know, a lot of what we draft is still useful, but it doesn't achieve its full potential. If so, for example, you have a trust, but even if you don't have a trust, but just using a trust as an example, if the trust never gets funded, then it's just a, an empty bucket sitting there waiting. So the biggest challenge is for when the client walks off, walks out of the office to make sure that they know that, you know, the job's not done. And I'm here to help them finish it, but it's not done right when you sign. So do you, would you say that's something that kind of makes you a little bit unique in that you're not just caring about the, the first step of the process that um, what we call funding the trust or funding, you know, mm -hmm. making sure all those ancillary pieces happen. Yeah, I, I would say there are a lot of a lot of attorneys, a lot, a lot of attorneys that do it the right way, which I'm trying to say is to 
um, make sure that everything is funded out. But there are also those out there that are just happy to sign over the documents and then say, see you later. So unfortunately, that's that's true. So you need to make sure you're with someone who um, tells you what the next step are and gives you instructions because these documents are going to be out here for hopefully and client by client, but hopefully decades along and things are going to happen. So you need to know what to do as as those decades roll on to make sure the plan stays stays current. So what do you like best about what you do in working with with the clients? Yeah, what what I like best is relationships. Um, you're really it's not a cold transactional area of law. You try to get to know people. Um, it's one that is ever evolving, and hopefully, you be, I become your attorney. Meaning, if you ever have any problems, um, I know I'm fairly narrow. I you can't come to me for when you run a speed getting get a speeding ticket, but you know you come to me and ask any kind of question out there and I can try to point you in the right direction. But um, it's just trying to build that relationship and it just not be the, you know, one and done churn out and, you know, see you later. Right. So really your ideal client is somebody that you feel like you're going to get to know very well, know their family, know their, what they're trying, their values, their virtues, what they're trying to leave behind and develop that lifelong relationship with. Exactly. Okay. And so how do these people find you? So certainly. Um, so I know through you, Carol, and, and then I have a handful of other great relationships. Um, but absent of those, um, you can find me on my, online. My website is zlawfirm.org, zlawfirm.org. Um, and then there's a, just contact me and reach out anytime. That sounds great. Um, well, Ron, thanks for sharing with us today. I'm, I'm really happy that you were able to be available to kind of share some nuggets with us and our audiences. And I appreciate you and everything you've done for my clients as well. And I look forward to chatting with you again sometime. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Take care. You've been listening to the Legacy Leaders Podcast with Katie Beth Hand and Stan Miller. For more information on them and the show, please visit PinnacleLegacyLaw.com. If you like what you've learned today, do share the program with your friends and subscribe wherever podcasts are found.